Great. Uh, well, thank you once again to the people in the room um, and welcome to those online. And thank you for joining us for the Asia Pacific Screen Forum. Those joining from all around the world, welcome. We're really excited to see you. And for those in the room, isn't it lovely to be here together today? And I'm glad you're already networking. I'd like to start by respectfully acknowledging the Yagamba people, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. And of course, acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room and online with us today. The Asia Pacific Screen Forum celebrates cultural diversity and cinematic excellence by linking screen creatives from across the globe. This year, we are pleased to be able to present the forum online and in person to continue the ABSA tradition of fostering international relationships and exploring new visions for the screen industry. Yesterday, at the rise of the Asia Pacific Cinema Panel, we heard from four of our previous MPA ABSA Academy recipients. They spoke of value in connections, of festivals and markets, in attending forums and masterclasses, whether it be in person or online. We are pleased that we can be part of that dialogue and remain committed to the vision of igniting and honoring cinematic excellence. We're here today to explore female leadership in the screen industry, and I'm excited to hear what our esteemed panel have to say. Within the Asia Pacific Screen Awards, we are committed to uncovering diverse voices and amplifying underrepresented minorities as we have been since our inception. I'm proud to be the first female identifying chair of APSA. We've had several female APSA jury presidents and chairs, including Australia's Jan Chapman and editor Jill Bil Bilcock. Nan Sun Shi from Hong Kong, the first female director from Saudi Arabia in Haufei Al Mansour, and our in oh, sorry, inaugural jury president was Shabana Azmi from India. Whilst we're not reaching gender parity in the competition, we are edging closer. Last year, female directors helmed 32.4% of the films nominated, and we have seen a steady increase since 2007. And we would love to see 50-50 by 2030, and I'd certainly like to see 50-50 in my time as chair. A lot has changed in the 13 years of competition, and I see the next 10 years as transformational for women, for people of color, and for minorities. I look forward to 2030 and seeing screen content reflect our societies and all of our people. And APSA, as always, will be there to champion the filmmakers. Now, before I hand over to Jane, um, I have to do a few quick housekeeping items. So firstly, for our panel, if you can make sure you mute your microphone, oh, sorry, for our audience, I think, to mute your, mute your microphone um, to ensure the best reception for everyone. And secondly, please post your questions in the Q&A chat box through the webinar so that we can prepare for question time. And finally, I want to confirm that we are recording this and we will be sharing it with participants after the event. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Jane Sloan, Senior Director of Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality, what a brilliant title, at the Asia Foundation, who will facilitate this webinar with all of us today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tracy. And it's great to be with you all. Uh, the Asia Pacific region is home to over 4 billion people, just over half the world's population. And it's the place of genesis for half the world's film. China recently overtook the United States and Canada as the most lucrative film market. However, the film industry is profoundly unequal. Women comprise more than half the population, and yet on screen, in the most popular films, female speaking characters are consistently outnumbered by men two to one. According to research from the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, in the top films from 2007 to 2017, less than a third of all speaking characters were women. Also, according to the same report, of the 1,200 people who directed the 1,100 top films over this 10 year period, there were only 43 different female filmmakers. 
just 5.2% were Black or African American, and 3.1% were Asian or Asian American. In the history of the Academy Awards, only one woman has won an Oscar for Best Director, and that's Catherine Bigelow for the 2009 film, The Hurt Locker. Since the first Academy Award ceremony in 1929, only five women have been nominated for the Best Director Award. The voters in the award process are overwhelmingly male and white. And Jane Campion was the only woman on stage for the 60th anniversary of the Cannes Film Festival, a situation that she said she found completely shocking, and which I'm sure we'd all agree with. If there are plenty of talented women who want to make films, why aren't there more female directors and producers? Two reasons are often given. One is that people tend to recruit in their own image. And so with the majority of directors being male, they hire men. And secondly, if there aren't many visible women role models for women, then it's harder for women to imagine this as a career path. The more we see women film directors and producers and cinematographers, the greater encouragement this will give to other women to believe that they too can assume these roles. And that includes capturing and making visible women directors and producers as they're working on films. Important here is for people in positions of privilege to call out the issues and help pave the way for diverse women to be involved in leadership roles in the film industry and to be paid at the same level as men. Thankfully, there's an increased momentum for this to happen and there's now a number of global initiatives designed to change the status quo. These include the curated talent discovery platform of underrepresented creators called Free the Work, launched by director Alma Harrell in 2019. And other initiatives include the Topple List, a Google spreadsheet of diverse filmmakers, and Film for Tales, a global community for female filmmakers to find opportunities and to collaborate. And the 4% Challenge, launched by Time's Up and the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative. The 4% Challenge asks producers and actors to commit to women-led projects, to at least one women-led project within the next 18 months. And major studios like Working Title and Universal have now signed the pledge. The rise in streaming platforms and the popularity of multi-episode series also seems to be opening new opportunities for female filmmakers around the world. It's clear that to change culture in a way that's sustainable and impactful it requires interventions at multiple levels to achieve a tipping point to shift power, resources, budget, voice and social norms. And so with this context, it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce our four stellar panelists to speak about leadership in film. After I introduce them, I'll moderate a 30 minute discussion followed by questions from the audience. And so I really encourage you to post your questions in the chat box. And so now let me introduce the panelists. All of the panelists, as you probably know, have phenomenal bios. And so we're posting expanded versions in the chat box. And in the interest of time, I'll be using abbreviated versions to introduce the speakers today. Greer Simpkin joined Bunya Productions as producer and head of television in March, 2015. After many years working in editorial and production roles in broadcasting for the ABC in Australia and Channel 4 in the UK. Since joining Banja, Banja Agri has produced the award-winning television drama series, Mystery Road, and the award-winning feature films, Sweet Country and Goldstone. Greer was an executive producer on the feature film, Jasper Jones, and she was a producer on the feature film, High Ground. Greer is currently producing Ivan Sen's Loveland and Leah Purcell's The Drover's Wife, the legend of Molly Johnson. Most recently, Greer produced the feature documentary, The Leadership. 
Ilibare is an award-winning documentary director, writer, and producer. Her documentary feature de debut, The Leadership, was one of six Good Pitch Australia finalists in 2016, and it premiered at the 2020 Sydney Film Festival. The Leadership was reviewed as a faultless piece of documentary making. As a documentary filmmaker, Illy won the Eureka Prize for Science, Communication and Journalism for her work on Becoming Superhuman in 2017 and the US Golden Sign Award for Environment and Science in 2015 for her documentary, The Secret Life of Breasts. What a great title. And she's currently based in Sydney, Australia. Rubaiyat Hussain is one of Bangladesh's handful of female filmmakers known for her debut feature film, Meherajan in 2011, which faced political and cultural wrath in Bangladesh for its anti-war narrative and its critique of masculine nationalism from a feminine point of view. Her second feature, Under Construction in 2015, premiered at New Directors Showcase at Seattle International Film Festival, and it was theatrically released and well received in Bangladesh. Her third feature film called Made in Bangladesh, uh, made in 2019, premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival and for which she received her first APSA nomination for the Cultural Diversity Award under the patronage of UNESCO. Currently, she lives between Dhaka and New York, making films and attending the Tisch School of Arts at New York University in Cinema Studies. Zainab Atakan was born in Istanbul and graduated from the Department of Film and Television at the Faculty of Fine Arts at Mamara University. In 2007, she started Zaino Film, a company dedicated to producing film product pr projects. In 2010, Zainab was awarded the European Film Academy's Best European Co-Producer Award. The same year, she launched Zapim Lab Workshops, with, with which she aims to share her experience and knowledge as a producer with young filmmakers. Zainab is the Vice President of the European Women's Audiovisual Network, which works toward equal opportunities for women working in the audiovisual industries in Europe and around the world. In 2014, Zainab's production Winter Sleep won the Palm d'Or at the 67th Cannes Film Festival, the festival's most prestigious award. Also in 2014, Zainab started Antalya Film Forum, a co-production and project development market organized as part of the International Antalya Film Festival, of which she was director until 2018. Zainab is a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science, the European Film Academy, and the Asia Pacific Screen Academy. And so with that introduction to our illustrious panel, we'll begin our discussion. And Greer, I'd like to start with you. You were head of fiction at the ABC for five years, prior to your role as head of television at Banya Entertainment. And of course, now you're operating in a very fluid market. As a producer, how do you view the current landscape for diverse the, uh, women's leadership and roles both be, uh, behind and in front of the camera? Well, you know, when I left the ABC five years ago, I have to say I was pretty depressed about the state of the television industry in particular. I felt like the corridors were filled with um, middle-aged white men <laughs> and I was a bit depressed. But, you know, in some ways, I think in the, in the five years since then, I think the industry has changed and I'll speak to two things that have happened just in the last couple of days here in Australia. Firstly, the Actor Awards, which are the Australian version of the Academy Awards. Um, the nominees for the best screenplay in TV out of the five nominees for the women. And that's a, a real first. One was an Indigenous woman, another woman, Julie Kalsip, that was Cody Bedford, and another woman, Jodie Kalsip, had her story um, was about a 
12 year old trans skin, transgender girl attending middle school. And for the first time in Australia, it was a transgender actor in the role. So that speaks to me that we've made some positive changes. Also this week, um, SBS, which is a multicultural broadcaster in, in Australia, announced their most ambitious drama series yet, which is New Gold Mountain. And it's being directed all four episodes by a young uh, Taiwanese Australian director, Corey Chen. And so I think those are two things that we can celebrate right now for the industry in Australia. I think there are a couple of reasons that things have moved on quite a lot. Um, the Screen Australia, which is a federal funding agency, government agency in Australia, funded a Gender Matters program that absolutely amplified women's um, uh, storytelling, uh, both you know, as writing and directing, and it was projects and it was initiatives, and we're seeing the, the um, outcomes of that right now. But I do think the Black Lives Matter movement this year really was a reckoning for the industry um, and looking at the ways we were ensuring that diverse voices um, were um, being amplified in screen content. And I think um, we've all had to look at our practices. And I think one of the important things is changing the gatekeepers, as it were, in the TV industry. So that, and I think there's some change already happening in that, in that respect, that the people that are at the decision-making table uh, need to not just be white middle-aged men. And um, I think that's, you know, that's something really positive that's going to change. And I think on the on-screen in Australia, again, I'll just talk about the TV industry, but um, a show called Total Control last year, the lead actress was Deb Mailman, an indigenous actor. It was one of the biggest hits in Australia last year. And perhaps I could say our own TV show, Mystery Road this year, that's mainly, it's written by an indigenous um, writers and directed by indigenous directors. And um, there's a big female indigenous cast um, in it. And it's the highest rating show in Australia this year. So it says to me that uh, it's not only um, the system that's changing, but I think audiences are really open to it as well. So I feel quite positive um, that changes are happening, still a lot to do, but changes are happening. Yeah, you've spoken to some really important elements, I think, that's, that's driving that change. And, and I think it's, it's also, important to recognize the combination of those changes that's really powering the difference now. Um, you talked about the institutional structural changes um, at a government level particularly, and also the funding incentives that help to make that change possible. And then coupling that with the power of diverse social movements to drive that change. Uh, most particularly uh, Black Lives Matter, um, Time's Up and, and Me Too. And all of that, I think, as you say, is really driving that commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion. Probably not as fast as we'd really like to see it, um, but, but yeah, that really does give cause for hope. Uh, Ellie, I want to turn, turn to you now. Um, when we first met, um, you said to me that you've always been drawn to stories. What do you hope to make possible with the stories that you choose to capture as a filmmaker? And can you share more about why you're so committed to documentary filmmaking? Sometimes I think people talk about documentary filmmaking as a pathway to other forms of filmmaking and I think you're really committed to documentary filmmaking in its own right. Yeah, that's right. I am really committed to documentary filmmaking and I think one of the reasons for that is because um, as a fabulous editor, Lindy Harrison, said to me a, a couple of years ago, every single person has a story. You can film anyone and you can you can you can um, find something in there that is meaningful and also that will um, help other people connect. And I think one of the um, when you're when we're kind of talking about achieving social change and we're talking about amplifying um, more diverse voices and um, all of the things that you know Bria talked about are, are totally necessary, as you pointed out, in terms of. Um, achieving structural change. But I think one of the, the, the really big things is also empathy. And that on, on, on a very, very base level, the act of um, storytelling and the act of making a documentary is really um, encouraging other people, the, the audience to put themselves in someone else's shoes, even just for 90 minutes or 20 minutes or how, however long the documentary is. And I think um, 
we see, uh, particularly with what's happened even, you know, uh, in 2020, just how important that uh, just that base level of kind of humane empathy really is. Um, particularly, I think, as well, when that we're seeing a lot of stories that are told in social media where people exist in, in bubbles and only see people who are, who are like-minded because of various alg algorithms. So I think the idea of actually just that really base thing that stories have the power to do, which is to help you understand what it might be like to be someone who comes from a very different place to you is, um, is really important. And that's one of the reasons why um, I think um, I personally am really kind of committed to that kind of storytelling. And it's also something I find really just fascinating and rewarding. I also think that, um, that, that through those personal stories on a very micro level, you can, um, you can kind of expand to, to layers that are much more macro and then do start to speak to systemic change. So I think that, um, that, that yeah, that, that's why I do remain committed to documentary. Yeah, I, I think that that point about being wired for stories is so important. I, it was the, the late feminist poet, um, Muriel Rukeyser, who said, our lives are made of stories, not atoms. And I think that's very true. I think what you've said about empathy is just so important as well. And particularly in this time of COVID-19, um, the idea of I see you and, um, you know, it's Martin Buber's idea of I and thou, um, seeing yourself in the other. And there's a whole movement now around um, thinking about the issues of othering and belonging. Who are we othering? Um, and, and how are we contributing to a sense of, of belonging and I think that these are really profound questions at a time of COVID-19 and um, you, you come at this so clearly in, in your own filmmaking so I hope that we have a chance to talk more about that um, as this conversation progress progresses. Rubaiyat I want to turn to you now. Um, in an earlier interview you said the core of my passion is my creative expression and my feminist identity. I'm a brown woman who lives both in the United States and in Bangladesh. As a Bangladeshi woman, as a brown woman, I went to college in the US where I found a freedom to raise my voice. So these issues of gender and identity are very important to me. When I was a student at NYU, I was drawn to black feminism, the colored body in the canvas of cinema. What does black feminism mean to you in your work as a filmmaker and in the choices that you make? Thank you, Jane. Um, well, um, you know, in, in all of my films, I've made three feature films so far. Um, I try to look at, I try to investigate um, how women exist, negotiate and navigate the patriarchal power structure. Um, and in doing so, I realized that women are not a homogeneous group. We have to look at intersectionality. We have to look at issues of race. We have to look at class. Um, and naturally, when I came to the U.S. <clears throat> as a brown woman, I found a lot of um, strength in the narratives of African-American population. You know, I think the history of African-American population in the United States is a a story of resilience and resistance. Um, and that's something I have always um, tried to learn from. And it's also a story of healing. And I think as a woman, we need healing, we need resilience, we need resistance, we need all of those things. Um, and when I was studying cinema studies at NYU, um, I, I realized how white it was. You know, the in, in our film theory class, the kind of films that we watched, very few of them were made by women or people of color. There was, you know, just spitely, you know, one day on black movie, one day on a uh, women director. And that made me question that, you know, we need to look at the representation of colored bodies on screen. Um, and there is much to decolonize, you know, on, on screen too, because, you know, if you think about a movie like The Birth of a Nation, which is so deeply problematic, but it goes, uh, as a very important text in cinema. You know, we still regard it as a very important text, but we do not talk about how problematic it is in its racial representation. So these are the kind of things that I 
try to engage in. Thank you, you've, you've raised such important concepts for us to be thinking about. Um, issues of power relate to so much of um, inequalities in the world today, um, that intersectional lens. So the multiple identities um, and experiences that we bring to situations, um, the idea of resilience and resistance and also the, the issue of representation. It's, it's really, I guess, resilience, resistance, and then also rep reputation. Um, and those issues that you spoke about of colonization of patriarchy and racism and how they impact um, that experience. And then very hopefully you speak about the stories of healing. And I think that also goes back to what Illy was talking about before about um, seeing yourself in the eyes of another or in the experience of another. Um, and then what that means in terms of how in our own lives we contribute to either othering or to belonging. Um, and so I think these are, are such important issues to be grappling with um, at this time of, particularly this time of COVID-19. So in light of that, um, Zainab, I want to turn to you now um, and to ask you how you have found it as a producer in Turkey and whether it provides a supportive environment for women in film at both an entry point and for women filmmakers ability to attract funds, resources and, and networks for the films that they want to make. And I think you're on mute, yes. Yes, I hope you are hearing me. Hello everybody, thank you Jane. Um, production was not uh, my mind at first when I studied film. It's 1986 and 87, there were few women filmmakers in Turkey. But it was also very heartening to see women producers and directors on single channel state television during the same years. As I worked in commercials in my school years, a director suggested I could uh, be a, you be a good uh, producer. And I began to in, investigate my uh, prospect more intensively and to approach all my work in filmmaking as a field of exper experiments. I, producer, was perceived in, as a financer in Turkey at the time, same time. But I applied the independent film model in Europe and I chose the projects I worked on. Much progress has been made in Turkey with regard to equality of opportunity for women producers. A substantial number of women filmmakers rose to prominence in the last 30 years. And approximately 10 years, we have formed certain organizations and networks to enable solidarity among women filmmakers. Of course, Eva, has been instrumental for our vision in regard in Turkey. Even though there weren't many funds specific to women filmmakers, there have been improvements in this front and there has been increasing awareness of equality and opportunity in Turkey recently. It would be unrealistic to expect things to change overnight, but we know we have a good expanding network in place. You know, it's it's really interesting, Zainab, where, that you shared in the beginning that it was someone else saying to you that you would be a good producer that encouraged you to pursue that path. And I think that what's interesting in terms of everything that you've made possible, you're such an entrepreneur in the way that you've engaged in the industry, is that you've really looked for other opportunities to mentor and coach other young filmmakers in that same way. And so I think it again speaks to the importance of that mentoring and advocacy role in opening up those opportunities. And you also spoke about solidarity. And I think that um, supporting networks of, of female feminist filmmakers is also really critical to being able to provide that level of, of support. And I know these are uh, concepts that we'll come back to um, within this conversation, but I think it is just so telling in terms of your own trajectory that one of the early things that happened for you is that someone else saw the promise in you and encouraged you to follow that path. Um, so for all the, all the young filmmakers listening at the moment, that should give you um, hope and strength. 
Um, Ilya, I want to turn to you now. Um, when you first heard of Fabian Datna taking a group of 100 women in STEM, and for those of you not familiar with STEM, in this, in this context, it means science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. So a hundred group of, uh, of women in STEM to Antarctica as the first trip of 10, um, an annual trip of 10 for creating a network of a thousand women in STEM leadership over the next 10 years. You had the opportunity to make a film of that first trip. Did you have an expectation of how the leadership story would play out? And you're on mute, just to let you know. And now I'm muted. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a, a great question and, um, and it's been asked of me and, and I think Gria, who is um, producer of the film, many times. Um, and uh, just to give a bit of context, the, the aim of the, um, or the stated aim of the um, expedition to Antarctica was to um, empower the women who are on board to be able to kind of, um, I guess, be, um, rise to leadership positions in their respective fields and therefore kind of make the, um, the increase of diversity, I guess, of people who are making really big decisions and who are driving research and driving innovation. And um, STEM around the world has really, um, uh, is kind of notoriously not diverse, um, both in terms of gender and particularly, um, yeah, in, in, uh, across the board, basically. So we were on board to, to film this expedition and we knew that we wanted to capture women's individual stories um, in, in STEM in order to illustrate some of those kind of wider structural obstacles that they face. And that was something that um, we, we knew that we wanted to do and we knew we had a whole boatload of women who had some kind of personal experience of this and who were, 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 were there kind of desperately kind of wanting some kind of support and um, community, I guess, um, because many of them were used to being the, the only women in their field or the only women in their, um, in, their, in, in, their, in their place of work. But what we didn't know was how the leadership sort of journey on board would play out. So in answer to your question, no, I did not know how that would play out. And without kind of going into the rest of the film, what I would say that it illustrates is that when people try and achieve social change, no matter coming from even the, the most well-intentioned places, sometimes this is a road that is kind of paved with many pitfalls and there are different kinds of leadership that are required at different times. And one of the things that we see in our film called the leadership is that the leadership that is required to get a massive movement off the ground may not in fact be the kind of leadership that's needed once that whole train is already on the road. So, um, so um, no, we didn't know how it was gonna turn out. And, um, uh, but I think that the story actually kind of illustrates some, some of the kind of complexities and nuances in leadership. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, it's been a, a, a big, a big road for us as well, I would say. Yeah, I think it's, for those of you who haven't seen it, I really go and see it. It's such an important film to see, uh, particularly at this time, you know, of, of COVID-19, because we really face, um, you know, the challenge of losing ground in terms of um, girls' access to STEM education, women's access to STEM leadership. And so, you know, it's, it's a grand vision that really... Um, that, that really propels this film. And it really does make you think very deeply about individual leadership, about collective leadership. And, you know, many of the themes that we've been discussing in this conversation today are themes within the, within the film itself. You know, that, that focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, um, you know, the power of networks, um, what it means to build a, a movement, um, what it means to have empathy and and healing. Um, and so, you know, and also I think that uh, being willing to fail when you have a grand vision or at least to be able to pivot and adapt accordingly. So, yeah, kudos to you and to Greer for your role in, in that film. It's, um, it's a really compelling one to, to watch. Rubaya, I want to now turn to you. Um, you've said that there is great strength that you gain from calling yourself a feminist. 
that men are great victims of patriarchy, just as women are, and which we often don't realise, that our fight collectively is for a better world. Can you, in light of what you've said, share a story about the relationship of your filmmaking to confronting and addressing inequalities? Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> Well, you know, I, I do identify myself as a feminist and I, I always say this that uh, what we have as women today, we have these rights because women before us fought um, and sacrificed. So uh, rights are not something that's just granted. One has to fight for it. Um, and patriarchy is a power structure that creates inequality and it creates pain, it creates violence. and um, it creates family structure, which are deeply unhealthy. So it cannot be good for uh, any children, a boy or a girl to grow up in, in a power structure that teaches inequality. And so I, I do believe that it, you know, patriarchy is something that is uh, truly harmful for humanity. Um, and when I started making film, what I saw that I was always outnumbered in my own crew. I was the only woman on set. I was the only woman in a room. So one of the things that I started doing is I started actively employing more and more women in my crew. So by the time I was making Made in Bangladesh, most of my head of departments are women. Um, and by doing that, I create a comfort zone for myself when I surround myself with other women. Um, there is, um, there's a change in my crew within the mindset because I work in Bangladesh and it's a, it's a patriarchal culture. And when I put women in all of the head of departments, um, the dynamic automatically changes. So that, that is something that I try to do in my own work to um, kind of create a safe space for myself. I think the points that you've made are such crucial points. I mean, this is something that we, um, that we're really focusing on, um, you know, within the feminist movement, certainly within my own work, that we can't just be focusing on one half of the population as well to be able to achieve women's rights. We've got to actually address patriarchy. We've got to be addressing gender norms um, and, and to really ensure that boys and men aren't just advocating for gender equality as, as champions for women, but they're recognising that they also stand to be the beneficiaries if they're not working insane hours that they're seeing their family and children, that they can engage in creative pursuits and tap into different sides of themselves. So it is something that we, we need to advocate for, for a, a better world. I think what you've demonstrated with your own filmmaking and, and with what you've just said as well is that filmmaking itself can be a political act, a profound act in terms of challenging um, patriarchy and challenging power and being able to promote that culture of healing that is just so essential. Um, so now with, um, with so much to talk about and so little time, um, I want to now turn to you Zainab. As founder of the Antalya Film Forum, as a co-production and development market and in creating Yappin Lab workshops. And I just have to say, I'm so in awe of the amount of things that you've catalyzed. It's really incredible. Uh, but you, um, you created Yappin Lab workshops as a launch pad for young producers. You're clearly invested in being a mentor and also an active advocate and door opener for young producers, which seem to be your life path. Did you have mentors and advocates who helped you to break into the industry and I know you you did start with that story and to become a, a leader in the film industry and what has been important to you in this respect um, and finally what advice would you give to young female and, and feminist filmmakers in terms of your own experience and path? Thank you Jane. Um, my main motivation in starting uh, Yapum Lab to ensure the transfer of knowledge and experience uh, to the next generation. And the Antalya Film Forum, my plan to enhance uh, to recognition and support the new generation of filmmakers from Turkey, especially on international platforms in both projects. I always try to cons constant communication and mentoring as a sustainable model of support. I regard it very important that I kind of master apprentice relationship 
is sustained in filmmaking. And I try to continue this tradition. I do my best to help and all filmmakers of the new generation and everyone whose work I, I appreciate. And during the development of my career, there was no such system in place in Turkey. The vision of uh, Kutlu Ataman, he's a very famous uh, film director and artist, uh, conceptual artist, the director of my first production also, has made my, an important contribution to my vision. And maybe only one person, former Orimage director, Renate Roginas, has also supported my extensively in my co-production with her advice and forming a network in Europe. There have been times when I really felt alone as I tried to my, find my own path. Times when I needed a mentor whom I could consult regularly. So I tried my best to help the new generation of filmmakers with mentoring. I would suggest women and feminist filmmakers to be deceived and resolute to keep their motivation at all times, and hence their work, network and ensure solidarity with other women filmmakers. Well, I'm just reading in the chat box, Zainab, um, from Mert Berdelek, uh, saying as an alumni of Yapim Lab, being a Turkish Australian, I can say not only is it inspiring, but life changing. I think that yes. um, speaks to the power of, of what you've enacted. I mean, you're really supercharging knowledge and experience for a new generation of, of filmmakers. And, and that's just so essential. Um, and I think it also speaks to um, the difference often between um, traditional ideas of mentoring, which is being a sounding board and being an advocate and um, and an, activi an activist advocate, which is really open opening doors, making those active introductions, finding ways to be able to tap into um, funds that can support young filmmakers. And I think that you've demonstrated, I think all of you do that in the way that you work. And it's a, a very powerful um, role to, to occupy and a really necessary one, I think. Um, so thank you so much for um, everything that, that you're making possible. And you've obviously got a, a number of fans um, who are joining the conversation today. Um, Greer, I want to ask you a, a question now. You've said in a previous interview that you're really interested in content that has something to say. But naturally you want to entertain However, your uh, modus operandi is to try and make content that has a point of view. Are there issues and stories that you're particularly drawn to at this point for the messages that they convey? Um, yes, you know, I've, I've, I think before us filmmakers, we spend so many years uh, um, on our films and, and, and features and TV shows. It's got to have, for me, it's got to have something to say or, or, or why do it? But, um, and part of our ethos at Bunya is to kind of um, something like Mystery Road, it's entertaining, it's a Western, everyone knows what it is, but there's a kind of Trojan horse in there. In the case of Mystery Road, it's about, you know, the impact of colonization on indigenous Australians. Um, and so right now I'm pretty excited um, about a couple of projects because um, as Illy says, and I said, was gonna say exactly the same thing, that filmmaking cinema has the power to move people, to change people's hearts. I really believe that and create empathy. And um, we've literally just finished a film called The Drover's Wife, The Legend of Molly Johnson, which is uh, actually, um, it's created by indigenous filmmaker, Leah Purcell. She's a polymath, actor, writer, director. She, um, she, she stars in it and it's a film about domestic violence. And it's something that's really a passionate issue for me right now in Australia. Domestic violence, particularly of women, is a real issue and the statistics are terrible in Australia, as they are in many places in the world. And, um, and I think also the notion of coercive control is something. And so there are a couple of projects apart from The Drover's Wife that we're developing at the moment. We're adapting a novel, uh, Things Without a Name, by author Joanne Fedler. It's being adapted to the screen by... Um, the beautiful writer Shelley Burse, and it's set in a in a women's shelter, 
and it's tough, you know, it's um, tough storylines, but I think we, we really need to illuminate these issues on screen because cinema has the power to look at complex issues in a way, I think, in, in a story, in, by storytelling. Um, we've got another uh, film, uh, we're adapting Prima Facie, which is a play by the Susie Miller. And um, that's about actually how the justice system in Australia and Britain in America uh, favours uh, the defendant over a victim in rape cases. So again, um, you know, difficult issues, but things that I feel really passionate need to, stories that need to be told. Yeah, and I think what you've what you've spoken about there is is really hard. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry, it said that the host muted me, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, I think that what you've spoken about is so important in um, spotlighting issues that require a lot more attention and a lot more money. I mean, I think if domestic violence was treated as the world's longest war, which it is, with the kind of money that's been thrown at, at world wars, we would have come a lot further than we have at this point. I think also what you've highlighted is making visible those issues that often aren't given the amount of attention or in many cases the women who are leading the um, the way in addressing those issues. I know that um, with Lema Gabawi who um, led the charge with a lot of women um, in um, working to end the war in, in um, Liberia, um, one of the really interesting things there was it was Abby Disney, the um, granddaughter of Walt Disney, who discovered that it was Lema Gabawi and this group of women who had surrounded a compound where men were working to sustain the civil war. And um, they told the men that they wouldn't let the men out of this compound unless um, unless they made that decision to end the war. And if these men tried to come out of the compound, they'd bare their breasts, which is like a hex on men. And finally, these women kept these men in this compound for days and days. And finally, the men made a decision to end the civil war. And then they turned their attention to getting the first female president of Liberia elected, which was Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And yet all the attention of the, um, the journalists and the, the men covering the stories was on all the male militants. And it wasn't until Abby Disney as a filmmaker heard about this story and said, this is a phenomenal story of women ending a civil war. And so she made that film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And it was a combination of that film together with a book about the same episode that meant that Lema Gabawi together with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and another woman ended up winning the Nobel Peace Prize. And so it, it speaks to what happens when you make women's stories visible, when you make issues that are profoundly impacting women's lives visible. And you're doing that in terms of focusing on domestic violence. All of you are doing it in various ways, but it speaks to what's at stake. And um, and this filmmaking being a political act. So I want to just honour all of you before I um, ask you one final question um, and then we'll turn it over to the audience to um, ask their own questions as well. Um, we've been taught, we were talking earlier um, before this session started about the impact of COVID-19. And so I want to ask you what one thing you would encourage us to pay attention to to advocate for and to act on in relation to women's leadership in filmmaking on and off the screen. And particularly in this time of COVID-19, is COVID-19 something that is further eroding the progress in terms of women's leadership in filmmaking? Or are there new opportunities that are being made possible at this time that are actually propelling new opportunities for women's leadership? So as you answer that question, if you could just pay attention to the COVID um, layer and, and impact at the moment, but what is one thing that you would encourage us to pay attention to, to advocate for and to act on in relation to women's leadership in filmmaking? And if I can ask you, Wu Bayat, um, to offer your thoughts here. Well, you know, because uh, Greer just talked about violence against women in Australia, and I'd just like to mention that during COVID, it's been a real issue. It's been a real issue here in the United States. It's been a real issue in Bangladesh. We have seen 
a lot of cases of child marriage, marital rape, women dying from marital rape. So um, I think that's something that um, has come out during this COVID that women are isolated and they really have nowhere to go. And it's something to be said about when a woman's home becomes a dangerous place for her. Um, and, you know, if there's one thing that um, I would like to see more or I'd like to advocate more for is not only, you know, having women directors or women writers, but trying to bring women's lived experiences uh, on screen, because oftentimes what we see on screen and the films that we see don't reflect women's lived experiences. Like, have we ever seen like a great film about childbirth? I don't, I don't remember, you know. Um, so there are so many experiences of a, a woman's life that we do not see in cinema, and I would just like to see more of those. Thank you very much. Um, Zainab. And again, um, you just need to take yourself off mute. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. It's very important that they focus on themselves and on the work at hand and react to any external demot demotivating, discouraging, comments may receive. Equality of opportunity is very important. And as a woman, we should be conscious of this. Women filmmakers should, should strive to create works that will correct the wrong impressions, prejudices and representation of women. And more women should work in produ productions, for example, with Wild Pear Tree, which I produced, there was a 70-80% for proportion of women working behind the camera and, may, and many women filmmakers got their start in their careers there, I guess. Thank you so much. Agria. Well, um, you know, I think for me, um, something, even though I have, um, um, exalted some you know, things that have happened this week as, as if they are um, exceptional. I'd love to be in a, in a world where um, we're looking at the language in which we describe you know, women directors as not exceptional or a risk, that we change the language somehow, that, that it just becomes normal, that we have all these women doing these great things and that we never, uh, I want uh, women uh, directors and, and filmmakers to be treated with the same lens as men who have been allowed to fail over and over again for a hundred years in the industry. And um, I just, um, yeah, I, I would just like there to be an opportunity where women, um, it, it, it becomes unexceptional that they are uh, helming a big Hollywood movie and that if one film doesn't work, they're given another chance. I want to live in that world. And in terms of COVID, you know, again, I may sound like I'm being really, really positive, but I think one of the important things about us all learning to work at home is that we've, um, I've hope, I hope that we democratise um, that, that the workplace in some ways, rather than going into these big patriarchal boardrooms and feeling intimidated by the meeting room, that meeting rooms in, in people's homes are humanising, that I'm starting to see male executives holding their babies in discussions, and I'm hoping that um, it's not no longer a, a dirty word to be working from home, which I faced as a young woman and a single mother. You, you could never work at home. So I'm hoping that all those things are, are positive. Yeah. Great. Illy, just a reminder to take yourself off mute too. Um, yes, I think everything that everyone has said, I agree with. 100%. <laughs> um, and I think, though, that um, something that um, we should all, uh, you know, that I think it's, it's important for white filmmakers to do as well is to look at cultural diversity in terms of um, in terms of your team, in terms of your filmmaking team, but also, of course, in terms of representation on screen. And um, something that I've been trying to do more recently is, is, is increase increase that diversity in my my crew um 
And I also think that with um, COVID, um, you know, whilst working from home can be a great thing sometimes for many women, it's, um, it can not be a great thing if you have really young kids. But what I have also found has been great is that um, actually different models of production in documentary are starting to, to operate, which is, which is, can be quite kind of liberating. So people are starting to be able to collaborate and direct more remotely and actually have multiple directors on, um, on a production, which has, is good and bad. But I think that um, just actually just freeing up all of these kinds of ways of working can, um, can, is a necessity at the moment. So I think actually having more voices in there is ultimately going to be, be a great thing. Well, there you have it. Um, I think we've all recognised um, that COVID has, um, has really elevated the um, dramatic increase in gender-based violence and violence against women. And in fact, COVID um, has become, a, many men have used COVID as a weapon to keep women isolated um, as well in, in much the same way as rape being a weapon of war as well. And so Rubaiyat's point about um, really ensuring a greater commitment to diver diverse women's lived experiences on screen, which comes back to our earlier discussion of ICU, seeing ourselves in the lived experience of diverse women being really crucially important. Um, we need to get more women in front of and behind the camera. Uh, and we also importantly need to change the language so that it's normal that women are doing great things, that, that there is equity in standards and expectations. And so the fact of women um, being film directors, film producers is unexceptional, but of course, in many ways it is exceptional because we do bring different viewpoints as well. Um, um, that COVID um, has in many ways um, help to democratise the workplace for some people at least. Um, if we can just continue to be able to push to ensure equity in caregiving and those changes in gender norms that will, I think, further enable that democratisation of the workplace and to be able to bring in that greater cultural diversity um, in crew, in team, in representation. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's really interesting to hear about the different models of production that have been made possible in a time of pandemic, um, that there's an opportunity to collaborate with multiple directors and to be up uh, to free up different ways of, of working and to have more voices. And I think that is also, of course, what diversity means. If we have diverse viewpoints, uh, diverse lenses, then it means that we are um, ensuring that there are more there's a greater opportunity to ensure the representation of people's lived experience. And of course, that not only ensures, in many cases, certainly in my work, it not only ensures diverse viewpoints, but often it saves lives as well. If we think of that book, Invisible Women, and the fact that without having women weighing in on the need for um, protective equipment, they're all made for men and women then are exposed to the virus and, and therefore are greater at risk of, of dying. So literally diverse viewpoints can often save lives as well. Um, I want to now invite all of you in the audience um, to ask any questions of the panel. And it's helpful if you can identify if there's a particular panelist you'd like to ask, uh, I would like me to pose a question to. We do have a question um, that was posed earlier um, from one of the people joining saying a lot of women, um, particularly immigrants, people of colour, tend to join the arts later in life. What advice would the panel give to women starting in the film industry and particularly those who are starting later um, in terms of being able to find a place within the film industry? Um, I might start with, with you, Illy, in terms of thinking. Oh, really? <laughs> um, sorry, am I muted? Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Um, I think that one of the things that I found the most helpful is, um, is finding your tribe, really, and finding your collaborators. Uh, and also being able to be um, vulnerable in that kind of, in that sort of setting, really. 
Um, I think that no matter what age you are, um, and particularly in, in lots of industries, but I think particularly in male-dominated industries, there is a bit of a thing of kind of a bravado, if you like. And I think that for, for you know, various reasons of cultural construction, that can, you know, come more easily to, to men than it does to women. I hate to make those generalisations, but I think if you're coming to anything new, um, being able to kind of like to be vulnerable and to be, I don't necessarily have all the answers here, but I'm going to find people who do. I'm going to find my tribe um, and I'm going to um, to find people who kind of essentially go, yes, I also have had that experience. Ultimately, lift the um, the kind of the impact of, of feeling unsure of yourself away from you and puts it more into the system, if you like. Um, it's a very abstract way of saying that, but I think um, basically finding your people is the is the, the the key. Absolutely. Well, I think it's also a life lesson, isn't it? Find your tribe, find your people, do it early, do it long. Um, so, um, Greer, can I ask you to weigh in here with any recommendations? It's hard to give recommendations. I would just say I, I am one of those women who came to actually producing, you know, very late in life. And so I always say anyone can do it if I can bloody do it. I only left the ABC five years ago and I'm a producer now and I left at the age of 49. You know, I'm very honest about my age. I'm 54 now. And the great thing about being in the in the in film really is you can keep going, keep working for quite a long time. So I think that's a that's a positive. And um and find companies that you see do champion having older women um, in them, you know, and do your research on that. Um, uh, uh, yeah, um, so, you know, in, in, in my company, I, I, I really try to do that myself, but um, so I, 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 I haven't got any advice except that, you know, um, it's never too late. <laughs> and uh, Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and as you, I mean, I think a phenomenal experience that you've brought, of course, to um, to being 49 and starting in the film industry. Um, and I think that your experience um, is, is something that makes you such a great role model for other women in so many ways. Um, Rubaiyat, um, you know, the one of the, the questions that was asked here was, you know, particularly for women immigrants, um, women of colour to join um, and to become involved in the film industry later in life. I mean, you're, you're straddling two worlds between Bangladesh and, and the US. Um, so your perspective here um, would be really important too. I think with people of color, with immigrants, um, oftentimes there are cultural issues at home. Um, you know, filmmaking is a profession that is demanding. Um, and in my own culture, I have faced that. Uh, I've seen other women in Bangladesh that it's hard for them to come into this profession because how demanding it is, um, how, how many hours you have to spend outside, how many nights you have to spend outside. And so I think those things, those cultural issues can be really challenging, um, especially I think with immigrants, when they uh, come to a foreign country, they try to cling to their culture. Um, and by culture, oftentimes it is um, how women are treated, how our women should dress, how our women should behave. So I think there is an extra set of burden we're talking about. And um, I think, you know, I don't think age is an issue because you have all these great life experiences that you can now work with. Um, and for me, I, I wrote a lot before I even could make a film. So, uh, you know, it doesn't take much. You can write and through writing, find your own voice. And then uh, through writing, one can uh, apply for grants when one can apply to um, workshops where they can um, enhance their skills. So I think uh, being alone and spending time in writing is a good way to meditate on the kind of work that one wants to do in the future. Yeah, wise words, very important, I think. Um, find your own voice um, as much as your own tribe uh, and don't let age be a barrier. Um, Zainab, from your perspective, 
what would you recommend? And also you're on mute, just to remind you, if you can just take yourself off mute. I'm so sorry, I cannot understand. I'm <laughs> okay. Uh, so my, you know, I always, as I told you before, I always focus on my way. Everybody, they have some way, but my perspective in um, uh, the next future, too many things will change. Uh, will change uh, some visions, uh, some aware awareness and everything. And the new scripts will change, of course. And we are, we are writing a letter uh, from this time. Maybe we will send, uh, maybe they will read uh, 100 years after. And we have to be careful. I said, we have to be careful and we have to be uh, very, very careful and respectful and we have to produce and we have to uh, do very good things. The first thing, we have to be a first good personality. If you are a good personality, you can do everything good, very well, I said. That is such great advice. I think everyone listening will resonate with that. Um, just a couple of other things. There's a, another question here. I also just want to note what Samantha Lay had reflected earlier about Femflix um, as a, a streaming platform that was launched last month, connecting female-driven storytelling. And uh, some of you um, on the panel might want to comment on that too as another opportunity for um, women's leadership in filmmaking. Um, there is a, a question um, for panelists. What advice do you have for when you get to a point where you're making a film where you realize that the intention or what matters to you isn't being carried out? And how do you address that? Um, so perhaps, um, Gilly, would you like to, to start in terms of your own thinking? Um, I guess, so the question is, sorry, do you mind just repeating the question? Okay. What advice do you have when you get to a point in making a film where you realise that perhaps your intention or what matters to you in making the film isn't being carried out? Um, I think that's really, um, that goes to the heart of what's really hard about making films I think um, about any kind of creative endeavor actually is that um, if you feel that something is not actually really authentic then um, for me personally that sits really it, it's right I just yeah it doesn't sit right but I think that that question is kind of um, it depends in what context you're making the film or the, the you know are you making this for someone are you working in a tv job where you are feeling like what broadcasters are wanting is very different to the, what you're what you think you you want to deliver or are you in a in a different kind of context and I think I've been in both of those contexts and I think that ultimately film these things are collaborations and um things never necessarily turn out exactly as you had envisaged them right at the very beginning. Um, but it is actually about um, about collaborating and it's really hard to comment on without actually knowing that really specific kind of um, context from the person who's asking the question. But I would say kind of faith into it, not away from it. <laughs> um, that would, that's, yeah, I don't know. I'm in a, a real position to give that advice. <laughs> no, thanks. That's great. Um, we have another question. Um, what genre would you like to see more female directors and producers breaking into? Um, Rubaiyat, can I ask you what, what you what you would hope to see? You, you've spoken already about a focus more on diverse women's lived experience. Are there particular genres that you'd like to see more female directors and producers breaking into? I, I don't think I'm a genre person here, you know, but I'd like to see more uh, work by more women directors in these streaming platforms because 
I think we have mm. we have been watching. Everybody has been watching a lot of Netflix um, since COVID struck, and it's difficult to find work that's um, by women or about women. So I think um, not only in cinema, but it's also important to see more women in television. Um, like Ava DuVernay is a director that I deeply admire. She has done great work in television, uh, which uh, talks about uh, issues of race in the United States uh, in a very meaningful way. So it, it, it would be great to see more, more directors like that and their work making it not only to these um, you know, art house festivals, but to the more to the mainstream, you know, yeah. um, um, and reach a wider, wider group of people through that. I so agree. I mean, I think in all my work of women's human rights, I mean, you have these incredible women leading movements and um, movements for change and facing the most incredible conditions and making amazing things possible under the most arduous circumstances but you never rarely see their characters reflected in feature films. I mean I think about Wangari Matai who led the whole Greenbelt movement in Kenya. It's phenomenal. I mean to have a feature film um, based on her life but you know her is a an incredible character who changed millions of lives. So yeah I think it's a really important point that you're making. Um, Greer, what, what about you are there particular genres or um or is it a, a broader issue as Rubaiyat has identified well you know I do think it's really interesting to see the female lens on very you know what's often been you know literally genre like science fiction and you know I did an initiative a couple of years ago where I brought out some you know people who worked on uh, Game of Thrones and um, uh, True Blood and, and those kind of heightened story um, story worlds um, to work with women because I think it's really exciting to see what women do in those traditional areas you know what Leah Purcell has done with this film we've just we've just finished which is a western you know it's a historical film but she's turned it on her head from both her female storytelling perspective but also her indigenous perspective so for me it's like in many of the traditional forms it's just exciting to see women in those spaces because they will tell it from a different perspective and never yeah I so agree. Uh, Matty Doe, I know a filmmaker that I interviewed for a project, she was talking to me about how excited she was as a feminist filmmaker to see what was happening around feminist lens and horror movies. So you're right. I mean, it's, it's happening in multiple different genres as well. Um, Zainab, is there anything you would like to say in terms of that question about um, are there genres or uh, approaches um, where you think there needs to be more attention um, in terms of women's leadership in film? I think uh, more, uh, <clears throat> more courage uh, projects and uh, different uh, representative on screen. And also I would like to see, maybe it's a topic, uh, but I would like to see works out of cliche formats, totally new formats, I think. Great, we're almost at an, um, at an end now. If there's just um, one final thing that you would each, oh, sorry, I would just like to say, there is one for me, if I can just invite one or two of you to respond to this. My six-year-old daughter has already noticed a lack of female characters in storybooks. Do you think supporting more female screenwriters will, will help girls and young women see themselves on screen in greater capacity? Um, and of course, this has been the whole focus of Gina Davis's um, institute um, focused on gender in filmmaking, which has been doing such important work over many years. Um, but I'll just read this question to you again for any of you who would like to respond. My six-year-old daughter has already noticed a lack of female characters in storybooks. Do you think supporting female screenwriters more will help girls and young women see themselves on screen in greater capacity? Would any of you like to respond? I think good for the six-year-old, you know. Yes. She really knows what's going on. Um, yes. And absolutely, you know, we, we want to see ourselves uh, reflected. And I think Amira Nair has said that it's, it's a very empowering thing to see oneself reflected on screen. Um, and it, it's very important to see 
uh, young women, um, not but not like in a Wonder Woman way, you know, where where you're so made up and dolled up, like real women. Yeah, like Hidden Figures, which was such a great film. Yeah, seeing. yeah absolutely. Anyone else like to comment on that? It's, it's such an important question. Um, it's something that we're really focused on at the Asia Foundation, um, actually in linking um, the books that we support being made by feminist authors with filmmakers as well, because it is really important to have a multi media approach to being able to lift up great role models. Um, but Greer, Illy, Zainab, is there anything you'd like to add um, as our final response before we wrap this session? Um, I think I, I, I may agree with, uh, oh, sorry, okay. I may agree with uh, Rubaiyat, uh, the same. And uh, too many way, uh, things and uh, too many, we need too many supporting, but uh, really good, a really good uh, uh, question. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for really, well, I really good. I will, I will think about this again. <laughs> I think it's also about um, role models in non-traditional fields as well, which comes back to areas like STEAM, STEM, um, STEM fields, um, which is, is so important. Uh, Greer, Illy, anything else you'd like to add um, before we finish? Well, I would just add, you know, it is really interesting when you start looking at the, the description of women in, in drama scripts, you know, so often, and I think maybe all of us do it, but I notice a lot that women are described in the big print by how they look so much more than men, you know, and it's really just, um, it's so important that we have female uh, sc screenwriters because they will change that, you know, and it, that therefore is how, how things are depicted on screen. So um, uh, the change couldn't, um, you know, happen fast enough as far as I'm concerned. I'm still reading scripts that do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Illy? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think we have all heard that, um, that saying of you can't be what you can't see. And so, um, you know, to the six-year-old who's noticing that, you know, she's not seeing what she wants to see. I think that's um, very powerful. And I agree with Rubea, good on her, <laughs> because yeah. that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily, it kind of washes over us and you kind of internalise internalize, um, the fact that you're not, you know, if I don't see these people doing these things, then I probably can't do them either. So um, I think that, um, yeah, I agree with everything that's already been said about the importance of having as, as many different kinds of stories and lived experiences um, on screen. And I think check, yeah, checking out Gina Davis's institute and the C. Jane initiative is really important. In some, um, I know that there's also some initiatives in some countries around, um, there's already women make movies, but there's actually a whole other initiative around girls make movies too. So it's not just about noticing female characters in storybooks, it's actually supporting girls to just get out there and do it rather than just, just to reflect. So that ability to be able to act is also important. Well, I think that's a wrap. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank our incredible panel um, and to thank all of you who've joined us today for your really thoughtful and incisive questions. I want to thank uh, Jacqueline um, and the entire um, AFSA Institute for all that you've um, made possible with this forum today and also to Tracy for her generous introduction too. I think it's been a really incredible session and uh, for those of you who have been able to listen, um, you'll be able to tell your friends that this has been recorded. So those who haven't had a chance to join today will be able to listen to a recording of this session and we'll be promoting it wildly, uh, wildly and widely afterwards as well. So thanks again to all of you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.